here it goes. Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am Krista Burns at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event where we cover Commission activities or anything of interest to Nebraska librarians across the state. Um, we have NLC staff that produce that do these sessions and we bring in guests. We have a mixture of that today. <laughs> um, it is every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. They're free, last for about an hour, um, and they are recorded in case um, you are not able to attend a live one, you'll be able to watch a recording of this one. Um, this morning, we are having our monthly, randomly monthly, <laughs> uh, Tech Talk with Michael Sowers, a technology <coughs> innovation librarian here at the Nebraska Library Commission, and he has some interviews he's going to be doing, and then talking about some other technology things. Yep, I suppose. news and new stuff. New, yes. So I will pass it over to Michael There's your cheat sheet. Um, to uh, go ahead and get started. All right. Thank you, Krista. Um, this is uh, Krista wanted me to put together a, a, a slide introducing Tech Talk. So you brand can, yourself. You, I'm, brand, I'm branding myself Elmo. Wait, I sure want to do that. <laughs> Actually, um, with the way I should have picked Kermit the Frog, a uh, bit of a frog in my throat today. Um, slept a lot yesterday. I'm feeling a lot better. Krista doesn't want me to breathe on her all too much, however. So uh, we're going to go ahead and kill this slide here and bring that up. And, and for those of you that have uh, attended these previously, you know that I like to do some interviews. I like to talk to librarians uh, both around Nebraska and around the country that are doing some interesting things. And today on the phone, I have uh, Marcia and Richard from the uh, University of Lincoln College of Law. And just want to check that both of you are on the line. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Hi there. Hello. Can you hear us? Oh, great. Okay. The audio is working. <laughs> Um, so uh, I've got some questions for you. I haven't really told anybody uh, what we're going to talk about today, although they can probably guess from what's up on the screen. But maybe if I could just give you uh, each minute to kind of introduce yourselves, uh, tell us who you are and uh, where you, uh, what you do at the, at the College of Law. Um, well, let's see. Uh, I'm the, uh, Richard Leiter. I'm the director of the Law Library and a professor here. I've been here for uh, 10 years. This is my... Um, tenth year at the University of Nebraska. Um, I'm Marcia Doherty Baker. I'm the Access Services Librarian here at uh, UNL College of Law, Schmidt Law Library, and that includes a little bit of everything. And uh, so the rumor I heard is that you guys have been doing a podcast for a little while. Uh, can can you tell us about? Uh, just what that is, uh, what it is you cover, who your audience is, just kind of the, the basics? Well, sure. Um, the podcast started in, um, when was it, May, our first show was May 23rd, 2008. Um, I had been listening to a um, one of my favorite podcasts, which I'll plug here, uh, This Week in Tech with uh, Leo Laporte, and uh, one of the guests on there was uh, talking about something called Blog Talk Radio, and it sounded intriguing, and I uh, logged on, got an account, and gave it a, a whirl um, on Blog Talk Radio, and, and it's open to anybody to, to, uh, to try out. It's a neat all-in-one web-based system that allows you to um, publicize the show, plan a show up to two hours in length, and then it's broadcast, uh, archived, and um, uh, allows you to take live uh, call-in uh, questions and comments and things. So it, it just sounded like fun. I like to experiment with new things. So we uh, got a uh, prominent um, law librarian uh, author, uh, Ken Svengalis, who's uh, an expert in um, acquisitions and knows the, uh, and commentator on the legal publishing industry, uh, to come on the show. And that first show, we had almost uh, 300 live listeners and um, 
so to date, it's been downloaded almost a thousand times. The rest was history. Uh, one funny uh, anecdote about that was um, on, on the first show, it was all very new to us, and uh, nobody knew really what we were doing. We just used the phone, as, the speaker phone as our microphone and uh, speakers, and somehow or other, uh, in the closing out of the show, we ended up in a an echo chamber, and it just got terrible. And so the last ten minutes of the show was this um, horrific uh, echo and not confusion. So we actually had to redo it. So I deleted the first show. The second one, um, fortunately, just as many people called back in and have uh, tuned in. But so, so over the last um, two years, we've had uh, almost 14,000 uh, listeners to, we've done about 24 uh, episodes. We started out doing it once a month, and um, Marcia started in the fall August. as my co-host in August this past year. And we uh, increase it. We're now doing it twice a month on the first and third Friday of the month. Um, we get uh, guests from all over the country. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had the Law Librarian of Congress on and a lot of notable people like that. One of the things I really liked about using Blog Talk Radio as our uh, platform for the show was the chat room. It was really nice because Rich could be hosting the show and talking to our panel or our guests. And as there were comments being made or websites dropped, I could quickly find them and add them into the chat room. I could do some quick polling. I'd ask questions of people that were involved in it. Um, it was a really nice way to have kind of a, a print version of the radio show. And that is one thing I missed when we moved from Blog Talk Radio was how easy the chat room was to use. It was, it was by yeah. far awesome. In, in the fall, we um, got picked up by the Center for Computer-Assisted Legal Instruction, uh, CALI, in uh, Chicago. And they used to go to webinar, webinars, just the way you're using, um, to uh, record the podcast. Um, and it's got, there are some trade-offs here and there, but we've been pretty happy with uh, the way things have been going. Yeah, right now what's up on the screen is the uh, web page for Blog Talk Radio. Now you've just switched it to our new web page uh, for, with Cali. And we had to change the radio show name for the podcasting in iTunes. Yeah. <laughs> and there were some little quirks about getting the show there. Um, it is downloaded. Uh, you can listen to it on the website or you can you know, download the, the podcast from iTunes. But uh, there's been some behind-the-scenes stuff that has been rather squirrely. Yeah. And we um, also publish the um, transcript of the uh, chat room um, uh, to go along with it. It's uh, often a very rich uh, source of information for uh, you know people who want to listen. So that's no. the it. We we just publicize it um, using uh, you know our professional email listservs. And, uh, and I post to Twitter and Facebook. Yeah. So it's gotten quite an audience. Okay. That, that wow. sounds great. Um, so with, with the move to the new system and, and looking at the, the, um, uh, the, the picture here, I have you see you have one of these wonderful blue snowball mics in front of you. And, and for those of you who can see the video, <laughs> yeah. we have one of those just kind of sitting off to the edge of the screen here. Um, the original system you were using, you said you just basically used the phone to, to take care of it. Um, with that yeah. picture of the microphone, I'm assuming you have a, maybe a little more equipment involved now with, with the new version of the yeah. podcast. Um, what, what's kind of the process now for uh, recording and uh, put, putting the, uh, the, the podcast out there? Yeah, now um, I was always concerned with um, quality. I mean, like I said, it, when I started the podcast, I just did it on a whim. I didn't think that anybody would uh, really pay attention or that it would continue. So the phone was good enough. Uh, but then when I started getting um, people calling in wanting to be on or giving me suggestions, and the numbers were astonishing, uh, 
to me. Uh, I decided I needed to get a little more serious about it. So I started researching mics. Really the only thing that, uh, uh, piece of equipment that we use that's um, extra other than our computer is the snowball mic. Um, the way it's recorded, uh, uh, Cali records it using uh, GoToWebinar's uh, capture process. We have learned, however, that it is important to do a backup. <laughs> so I've always, um, one of my co-hosts, who, who's also the webmaster, um, he's at Georgetown University, and he listens in and he records it to as backup. And that's it. Uh, we just put the the uh, the recording up on the website, uh, and then we have um, the webmaster has come up with the process that automatically uh, puts it up on iTunes. Great. So, that's how it works. so what what um, what what is your uh, impression of your your audience? What sort of demographics are you getting? Lawyers, just law librarians. Do you, do you have any sort of ideas to what sort of uh, your your audience is? Oh, it, it's definitely law librarians. Um, the subjects that we cover, the topics that we cover, are uh, would be of no interest to anybody outside the profession. Uh, my mother, uh, I think, tried to listen once, but she had no idea what we were talking about. It's pretty specialized. Um, and uh, it, based on what we've seen, the feedback that we've gotten, and uh, looking at who comes into the chat room, they're all uh, law librarians from uh, all over the country. It also depends upon the show, because some yeah, of them are yeah. pretty specific. Like we did uh, a show where we talked to firm librarians. Yeah. And that one had a little bit of a different audience uh, participation because it was very specific and that one's been downloaded a lot because people yeah. students who are going to go work uh, in a firm they like to listen to that one when we had um, our discussion about Google Scholar that was a really big show and that had a lot of uh, you know law librarians who have tech interests they were on because they wanted to listen to Honorog talk about how they put together Google Scholar and that's yeah. one of the things when we promote the show we add a, a show blurb so people know what they're getting into before they actually you know, commit to listening or, or go and download it. There's regular people that do that, but we like to give them a little bit of a teaser so they know what's going to be going on. And then when they get into the chat room, they have an idea of, of what the conversation is going to be about. But it's definitely law and, and a legal audience. Yeah, the our biggest show by far was when we interviewed um, Anurag uh, Acharya, the uh, engineer at... Um, uh, Google, uh, for Google Scholar, and that one's been do downloaded uh, 1,100 times or so. I was just looking for the, we, we set up one show where we had a group of firm uh, librarians um, in San Francisco uh, talking with us, and that one is probably our second largest uh, audience. But it's a hit and a miss, too. Some of the shows that you have a, a big name in the field on, don't always uh, have the live audience or the downloads you would expect. And so I don't know if there's a generation gap there or if uh, maybe people have heard them at conferences and stuff before so they don't feel like listening in. I, I mean, yeah. there's no rhyme or reason. It seems like the ones we think are going to be, uh, you know, high participation in <laughs> yeah. a lot of audience, there's not, you know, and, and sometimes it's the Friday. I mean, you know, Good Friday. Yeah. Who wants to listen to a radio show that day? So yeah. our downloads were higher. Although uh, for uh, that shows oh wait a minute that's right that's on the yeah that's but on the never mind yeah. and we're still working on getting statistics from the law librarian conversations because block talk radio was great at giving us numbers and you know as a librarian you get used to looking at your circ stats or you know reference stats whatever so we're always looking at show stats but with the new platform finding that out has been a little bit more of a challenge uh, it's still fun yeah. Well, you, you may have just answered my next question, which is what, what is the biggest challenge in doing all of this? Uh, you know, what, what you, know, ro uh, uh, you know, speed bumps, yeah. I, I mean, is it time, yeah. is it finding the guests, what, 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 what's the hardest part oh, of yeah. all of it? Well, okay, the, for years, I, I think I was born with sort of um, a cynical uh, gene, and so I tend to look at 
lots of things uh, critically. And you know, when you watch TV or watch the movies and you see all these producer names fly by, you always think, yeah, why does this person have their name on there? What did they do? You know, they gave money to the show. Producers, who cares? You know, it's a cheap way of getting, or an expensive way of getting your name attached to a production. But you know what? I have completely changed my opinion. Producing the show is the biggest uh, challenge. We don't have that, that hard of a time finding guests that want to be on. Uh, I'm surprised at, at that, actually. People are, I've, nobody's ever said no, um, uh, flat out. But getting the timing right, getting everybody together at the same time, um, coming up with the topics. Or um, we've had situations where we've had too many people wanting to be on, and so then having to put them off and say, no, we, we can't do this show, you know, that topic this week, but we've got an opening two weeks from now, um, getting that kind of thing uh, working, which is the production part, uh, has been my biggest challenge. And then uh, when the show is scheduled to uh, go live at 2 p.m., and I still haven't heard from my guests at 1.55, and that's when I start sweating bullets. Um, Marcy's seen me practically disrobe in the, the library because I'm starting to get so hot well, waiting for the guests to call in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's the biggest challenge for me. Yeah, I think on my end the biggest challenge is when the chat room is not functioning. We had one show where everybody kept trying, you know, to, to add their comments and, and to interact on it. And... It just, it was not working. Like, you try and post something three or four times, and it wouldn't show up in the chat room. And so people just finally quit. And so instead of using the, the Law Librarian Conversation chat room, then we went to the go-to webinar chat. And so I was trying to maintain these two different chat rooms, and some people were in both and, and others. Uh, and then the very first show we did with the Law Librarian Conversations in the chat room, Every time somebody would hit like the at sign, it would turn into a smiley face. So any yeah. type of punctuation people were doing in their comments, it was your your icon. I mean, it was your your smileys. And and so this whole chat room was just like colorful with people's comments, and then this odd punctuation that turned into smileys or winks yeah. or, I mean, it was the oddest chat room transcript I had ever seen yeah. after that one. Well, so, and then. Go ahead. I was just going to say, so sometimes the chat room is the is the the most fun, but also the most challenging because I mean sometimes there's things you can't control. You're in a live show and you just got to go with it. Well, the, and and that's what I was going to say. Last summer we had a little construction going on, right in the middle of the <laughs> yeah. show. The fire alarms went off. Uh, there was no fire, but uh, one of the um, I don't know, a painter or something like that was sanding too close to a smoke detector and set it off, so, um, and the fire alarm is right outside my office, and we do this right in my office, so. Yeah, oh, that was bad. Yeah. yeah. We've had barking dogs, we've had. Uh, we had one person calling in from Starbucks, and so yeah. <laughs> every time she would ask her question or she would comment on stuff, you could hear, like, people placing their orders in the background, <laughs> and, and you could hear coffee being made and stuff, so that one was really just, yeah. like, yeah. Could you maybe go to the bathroom and talk to us? I mean, it was just this background noise that was... But that she, was... And, and she justified it. She said, but it is the Starbucks in the federal courthouse in Montreal. Yeah. So it had okay. a lot. Yeah. It had a lot. Yeah. So, yeah, we've had, I mean, anything, I, would, I don't want to jinx this, but we've had a lot of odd things that happen through the show, and you just go with it. I mean, there's not a lot you can do. This is, this is very low budget, but fun. Yeah, then one of my regular, one of our regular panelists is the executive director of uh, NELCO, the Northeast uh, Law Library Consortium, and she was calling from home, which is where her uh, office was, and her uh, son, 10-year-old son, was home sick that day with the flu, and she told us afterwards uh, that would she would she would sort of disappear every once in a while. It was. Her son had her his head on her lap while she was doing the interview and throwing up from time to time. I would, you know, it's live 
things like this you just never know. So either we have people who are very committed to being on this show, or it's just, you know, yeah. it's comedy. Yeah. I've, I've been told that during a presentation I will be giving on Friday, the campus will be testing their tornado warning system. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, so yeah, 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 yeah. not only will that be going off, but where I will be presenting is one of the places people are supposed to go. So we might actually get some additional audience members there you go. Uh, during my talk. You just got yeah. the yeah. lining. Um, yeah, I, I do the captive's audience. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Um, I do believe you, you, you touched on this earlier, but we do have a question that came in from Steve. Is, is how do you advertise and promote the show? Mm. Well, on my end, I use social networking to, to do the promo for it. Um, I manage the library's Twitter account and Facebook fan page. And so I am posting to that on a regular basis. I also post, um, we have a, the Law Librarian on Blog Talk Radio fan page on Facebook that I post to. And then the new show has a Twitter feed, and I'm posting to that. So, you know, you kind of hope with all of that you're hitting different uh, followers or fans, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, Rich does the more formal promo. Well, the, um, now, that we're, it, well, now we're using GoToWebinar. There's that formal, um, you know, invitation that goes out. Um, and before that, I just did an email that summarized what we were talking about. But I send them out on uh, professional listservs. There's um, three or four uh, that I regularly um, send to. to and, and our system is um, we do it on, on a Friday. So the Friday before I send out an announcement that the show is coming up, I try to send out an, an email on Monday before and then the Thursday before. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting. We, I find that <coughs> most of our listeners are people who would listen to podcasts uh, anyway. And so they tend to be the kind of people that will uh, follow Twitter uh, you know, or, or, or things like that. And I think that, that Twitter is probably uh, one of the most effective um, ways of getting the word out. Mm -hmm. Of course, any any way that you can publicize it, I'm sure, be effective. Yeah, and I've talked about the radio show in different presentations I've done as, you know, one more way to market your library or to promote it. And so we've had some interest that way. Uh, it's really nice with Cali having the go-to webinar software. They can go ahead and push out those invites. And so anybody that's participated in our show before signed up for it, they're automatically getting those invites each week as kind of a reminder, by the way, the show's coming up. And that's that's been really nice, just because it's it's one more um, entity that's promoting the show. It's just not us over and over. Yeah. You know, there, there's somebody else out there. <laughs> no, you know, this also uh, one important thing um, I think to uh, that should be pointed out uh, and advice to anybody who's thinking of doing something like this is uh, two things. Number one, uh, be consistent. Uh, it, so if you start to do a podcast, um, many podcast listeners like to go to iTunes and subscribe. So they like to see a podcast that's coming out regularly. And so I would, my advice is to pick that schedule and then stick to it. The second thing is um, be, don't be overly ambitious. Uh, you know, don't. I remember when I first did it and the first show was so successful, I suddenly was thinking, I, I, I want to do this every week. And, um, and that's just too much work. Um, and, and I talked myself into being a little bit more realistic, and we started out doing it once a month. And um, I tried to be as faithful as possible about doing it once a month, just so as you're building your audience, they can uh, expect that the show is going to be, um, you know, available once a month or whatever the schedule is. And now we're doing it first and third Fridays, and I'm sticking to it. We had one show that we switched to uh, Thursday, and it's actually uh, in our statistics our lowest listened to show of all time because we varied from our uh, regular schedule. Yeah, People that's, that's, are creatures of habit. <laughs> yeah. Yes, that's that's the one thing I can agree with both as 
as a podcast producer and a podcast listener, mm-hmm. I you know I almost don't listen to regular radio anymore. It's it's almost all podcasts and. You know, we, we do ours here, but then we also put it out as a podcast, and I'm responsible for converting it to the MP3 and putting it in the RSS feed and all that fun stuff. And I'm several weeks behind, actually, in, in getting those up. Because, you know, a little busy, right? You know, conferences, yeah. uh, major projects, things like that. So, yeah, um, it, it is, you know, I agree with you. It is a commitment. I don't want to scare anybody away from podcasting, mm-hmm. but it is it is a little more than just sitting down for an hour and recording a show. Mm-hmm. Uh, there, yeah. there is a, a process involved. Um, so that's great. And, yeah, and, and people do enjoy listening to conversations about things that they're interesting in, in, interested in. Um, you know, radio uh, as a media, I think, is, is just extraordinarily popular and continues to be. And I see podcasting as sort of um, a variation on... Uh, broadcast uh, radio. It's something that people listen to, and uh, it, that that's almost uh, it's almost frightening at how um, uh, quickly you can build an audience and a loyal uh, audience. And um, you know, and, and once you you know start to get people interested in what you're doing and listening to it on a regular basis it's it's very important to keep doing it you know keep the discipline um, uh, you know to I, I, I was going to say keep them happy but that's not uh, exact keep them interested and keep them giving keep giving them what they want you know and um, so I've got one more question, but I just want to remind folks that you, uh, if you are listening live, you can uh, submit a question in the questions and answers area of GoToWebinar. Um, or if you have a microphone, raise your hand yep. and let us know. We'll unmute you and you can ask your question on your microphone. Yes, yes, we encourage that. Um, more voices. Yes, more voices. Um, so I guess my question is, 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 is where, where are you going with this? Do you, do you see... Um, is there something you, you're planning on doing eventually to kick in, or you just, you know, at this point, is is getting the show out twice a month enough? <laughs> you know, at this point, um, I'm having a lot of uh, fun uh, doing it. It's um, it is work a little bit, but I'm enjoying it because of the response that we're getting. The the and the the quality of people that have been willing to um, to be on the show. Uh, when Google Scholar announced their uh, legal opinions uh, product uh, back in November, um, it was a you know it was a shocking thing. Nobody had heard, seen it coming, um, but everybody was interested. And I thought we've got to have a show about this. And so I started Twittering, uh, does anybody know someone from Google who would be willing to talk to us about it? And we ended up with the chief engineer for Google Scholar um, on the show. He was not just willing, but he was anxious and happy to do it. And then the law librarian of Congress, uh, I got a call actually from somebody on her office saying that she wanted to be on. and, you know, when could we arrange a show? And um, I've found that uh, any everybody that I've asked, like I said before, uh, has said yes. We had John Palfrey from uh, the Berkman Center at Harvard, uh, Carl Malamud from um, uh, law.gov and public resources, um, just anybody. And so I... I'm just having so much fun, and the response is is, um, is positive. Uh, guests keep wanting to come on and, and talk. But I have no plans to quit. I mean, I, I suppose if uh, um, CNN or somebody wanted to pick us up, I might give it a consideration. But I, I, uh, it'd be a little bit too specialized for uh, uh, yeah. I. I am officially <laughs> jealous of your of, of your uh, your guests. By the way, I, yeah. uh, I haven't had anybody yeah. say no, but I don't exactly have people calling me either. So uh, yeah, um, yeah, uh, well, I'll, know, I'll put that plug the... in for this show. You know, please, I will be happy to talk to you. Give me a call. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay. You know, that's been one of the fun things about having people on our show is you read all the different blogs. I mean, and you know, you have your, your usual suspects. And then you get your official emails and all of your professional listservs. So having the radio show has been a really nice way to have conversations about hot topics in the field. And you have people who are writing blogs who want to come on the show and talk about something. Or you have a very current event like the Google Scholar, and you're getting the people that are involved in making something on the show to talk about it. So I think that's been the best part about it. It's, it's kind of that 3D version of yeah. you know brainstorming and interacting that you usually only get to do at conferences. Well, we get to do it twice a month on the radio. Yeah. And so for us, that's been the fun part. I think the only thing we're planning on doing is in July when we go to Denver for AAAL, we're going to try and get everybody who's been on the show together for a group picture because yeah. we don't have that. I mean, oh. none of us, some of us haven't even met before, and we've yeah. been spending time together Friday afternoon. So that, that is like a goal is we've got to get a picture, a group picture. Yeah, yeah that's like fun. Uh, awesome. we, have one, we have one more question from the audience, if I, if I can get yeah. that in. We're, we're kind of running low on time, but the question is, is Sure. Have you noticed any side benefits from doing this? For example, have you made connections that you've been able to take advantage of at work? And, and Marcia, you were just kind of talking about networking there a little bit. Yeah, I think it's been a networking thing. I mean, I'm new. I, I've come from public libraries, so I am very new, <clears throat> excuse me, to the law library world. So for me, it's been definitely uh, kind of a jump in networking and getting my name out there so people know who I am. I think the only thing I'd like to see is sponsorship from like Starbucks. I would love that. Yeah. You know, somebody who will bring us coffee during the show. I would totally plug it. Yeah. Um, but I think for me, it's it's been the professional networking. That's probably the benefit that I have seen at work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The um, you know networking, getting the name of uh, the university out there to a, a larger uh, audience. Um, you know, we're the University of Nebraska. You know, nobody on the coast knows where Nebraska even is, but uh, now they all know the University of Nebraska, and, and that's a good thing. And plus, I think that there's also um, sort of a, a deeper uh, benefit just in continuing the conversation about these uh, issues. Uh, librarianship is largely uh, about, um, or a significant portion of what we do is about networking, calling on colleagues and knowing who to call, um, you know, for advice or input about uh, projects that you're working on. And uh, this gives us an opportunity to keep, you know, talking to each other and finding out who you know, what are the good blogs? What are the who are the experts? You know, in this field or that field. Yeah, and it's been a fun way to find out what other people are doing. Mm -hmm. You know, like what technology they're using. Uh, there's a lot of people that you know they might use Google Wave, where instead we use, you know, your traditional listserv or something. And and being able to talk about the different webinar software that's been fun. Mm -hmm. So just having kind of that continuing education that you don't get elsewhere that you can have a conversation and, and you can learn from everybody else and what they're doing. Yep. And we did we did get one more question in and, and Mercy, I think this was because you mentioned you just came over from the, 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 the public library world. But um, how how would you see podcasting this process is is uh, possibly being used in public libraries? Uh, we a lot of our oh. audience are public librarians. Uh, what advice would you give them? Why should maybe they be considering doing this? I would say go for it. And, uh, you know, I do know of one example, Lincoln City Libraries podcasts. Uh, they used to be on the radio show, traditional radio, and now they've moved to a lot of podcasting. But it's great, you know, especially if you have a teen advisory board and you've got some students who are responsible. You know, give them a flip camera and a mic and let them go to town and enjoy what they're doing. You can have podcasts of your, you know, your different programming or even your book talks. I mean, there's so many options out there. I would say why not? And the nice thing about podcasting is there are some people that can, that get a little weirded out about having an actual video feed. And so this is nice, especially if you have a decent radio voice. You can just go ahead and talk about stuff, and you can be your own like local um, celebrity for your library. And it's really cool that way. You can also do a lot of group work. I mean, if you have um, like a public library, you know, like your system, or with all of the branches, you can get together and people can just call in and you can have that conversation and podcast it on a, a, an event. 
Um, I'm thinking there's a lot of in-service things that go on. Maybe everybody can't get to it. We could podcast it and have them listen to it later. I mean, I think it's a great opportunity for any library, but I can see where public libraries with all of the diverse clientele that they serve could really use this. And, you know, it's, it's free for the most part. And it, it takes either a phone or the mic on your laptop. Yeah, it, the, one of the, the reasons I think that uh, Law Librarian Conversations has been uh, as successful as it is is because it's highly specialized for a, a very, um, you know, specialized audience, law librarians. There are 6,000 of us in the country. And so it, what we talk about is only of interest, you know, to people that are interested in what, you know, law librarianship or legal bibliography is all about. And so that's highly attractive to people that are, you know, that are in the field, and that's why we get so many people listening. For public libraries or for anybody else considering uh, podcasts, I recommend uh, trying to make uh, targeted podcasts. Mm -hmm. So if you have one for young adult literature, you know, have, you know, have it focused that narrowly or um, you know, science fiction, you know, the science fiction hour or something like that once a month where you get people to talk about specific types of literature. Um, that would, could attract people that are interested in that one area and not have to listen to, you know, somebody talk about new acquisitions about you know, gothic romances uh, yeah. if they're not interested. Yeah, I think if you pick your niche audience and you go with it and you're consistent and you promote it, you're going to have a great following. And it's very easy today to um, to do with, with um, you know, a little bit of elbow grease. The learning curve's pretty steep, but uh, anybody with a Mac, a, you know, the garage band comes loaded right on the the computer, and it's a highly sophisticated mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, program that will allow you to produce, you know, stunning uh, podcasts with a little little work. So it takes no investment, hardly at all, and and it's easy to get up on iTunes, and boom, all of a sudden you've mm -hmm. got a podcast. So I I think it's a, a terrific uh, uh, medium. And, and with that, I'll, I'll, I'll plug uh, Audacity for those of us without Macs uh, to do that. Uh, that yes, that's software. true. It is Audacity. Yeah, yep. and, and it's free open source. In fact, I think it does work on Macs, too, if, you, if you, you're not a yeah. fan of GarageBand. So um, yeah. we, we, um, I want to think we're, we're pretty much out of time. I've got some news things I, I also want to cover in, in, in our hour here. So, Marcia, Richard, I want to thank you very much for participating, and this time you guys got to be the guests. Uh, instead <laughs> yeah, of the yeah, it's kind of fun. Yeah, it's fun. Now, fun now, now you thank know you how the other half for, feels. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, thank you very much for having us <laughs> on. And, you know, feel feel free to stick around for the for the rest of the uh, the, the hour here. You, you might pick up something you, you don't know. I mean, I hope so. I, as long as somebody picks up something, I think I'm doing my job. Uh, so I uh, want to thank you very much. I'm going to go ahead and put you guys back on mute. Um, thank you. Oops, that's yeah. muting me, not <laughs> them. That's uh, wrong, wrong button there. Uh, so let me find the right button here. Uh, there we go. Uh, I want to thank them one last time for attending. Excuse me. And it takes, it takes some time. There you go. There we go. Keep my finger over the mute button as I uh, cough a little bit here. Uh, the, the joys of also video uh, going on there. You get to see me uh, cough uh, while we do that. So what I'm going to do is now I've got about uh, 15 minutes left here. I've got some bookmarks. I spent the majority of last week at the uh, Computers and Libraries 2010 conference in, just outside of D.C. in Arlington, okay. Virginia. And Krista was there too. <laughs> yes, sorry. Um, and um, most of the kind of bookmarks that I've got here are things that I found uh, from the conference. And I always like coming back from conference and going through my notes and trying to figure out all of this stuff that, that I want to look at and, and take a look at. So I'm just going to share some of those uh, things uh, with you. We'll jump around in my list here just a little bit. Um, the first one I'll pull up here is a uh, Flickr photo that was posted, a sign that was made um, that I have printed out. 
and uh, that I will be hanging on my office door, and uh, maybe a library or two might be interested in hanging this uh, on the door to your library. Um, but I just, this wonderful quote, cutting libraries in a recession is like cutting hospitals in a plague. Um, that you can bring up full size from Flickr, uh, free, uh, and uh, possibly use that. Um, <laughs> excuse me. <coughs> I am noticing that the, uh, the uh, person who posted this did put a uh, full-blown uh, copyright statement on that, so I don't know if we can actually uh, legally just print that on post -it. I'm going to go ahead and, and contact uh, Daniel there and see if I can maybe get him to switch that over to a Creative Commons license uh, free to use. But uh, one would hope that he would mm. allow libraries to uh, print that out pretty darn freely. Very uh, relevant to that. lots of things, lots of libraries having these issues with budgets and being closed yes. down, and et cetera, et cetera, and staff furloughed and it's happening everywhere. I, I spent a few hours with a colleague from um, another state. I'll, I'll leave the name out at the moment, but major library system and the board meeting that she was uh, watching live online while I was talking with her in the airport uh, said, I think the, the good or best case scenario is they would only be laying off 63% of the library staff. So, uh, and that, that, mm. that was at the good end of things. So, yes, uh, we, we need to be uh, letting people know that, you know, we need that money. It, it's out there. It's very important. Um, one of the uh, blogs that I discovered while I was there is called Hey Otis, brand new blog. Um, one of the uh, keynote speakers from Computers and Libraries this year was the Archivist of the United States, uh, David Fierro, I think I am saying his name correctly. Uh, he has a blog. He is the first Archivist of the United States that is also an MLS degree librarian. Yes. Uh, many of the previous ones have been um, historians and college professors, and nothing against that. Uh, but it's nice that we have an archivist that, that is now a librarian. He has a blog up. I'm going to start reading that uh, myself. And the other link I have listed here just below that, I won't actually bring this one up here. Uh, David Fierro, uh, Archivist of the United States, CIL 2010. That keynote was recorded, was, was broadcast live on Ustream, and you can watch that. Uh, very interesting interview. Uh, go ahead, Kristen. Oh, yeah, it was a very good interview. So it's not just him up there talking head type thing. He was interviewed by Paul Hopengraber, the, um, what is he, the director? Of director of programming. Programming at New York um, Public Library. So um, very good, very interesting, very entertaining. Yes. <laughs> um, back and forth between the two of them. Yep. Um, something that happened while we were at CIL last week. In fact, when I first heard this, I thought it was like a late April Fool's joke. <laughs> um, but the Library of Congress has gotten a hold of a copy of the complete archive of all tweets that have ever been done. Um, as somebody from, I think, MIT tweeted, uh, Dear Library of Congress, could you please get rid of the night of December 27th? <laughs> um, but uh, if you've ever tweeted anything, the Library of Congress now has it in their archive. Uh, I don't think they're going to try to catalog every single individual tweet or anything like that. I'm not no, sure exactly no, what they're going to do with it, do that. <laughs> um, but that's a heck of a lot of data. Well, so. They have digital archives of things they've been doing in other areas <laughs> for a long time. And this is just another one that actually Twitter approached them saying, hey, what do you think? And they talked amongst themselves, I guess would be the way to describe yep. it at the Library of Congress and decided, yes, this is something important that does need to be um, saved. Um, so, And actually, it, the because um, it's got a link to the a AOTIS blog, the uh -huh. Archivist, okay. he actually blogged about it with very nice... Um, why would the Library of Congress want these? And so he's got a nice blog post about that. Great. So definitely go back and read that, and you can get a good idea of you know the reasoning behind it all. Yep. Um, hey, hey, speaking of Twitter, I thought I, I gave Chris and I both gave uh, Twitter presentations uh, while we we're at the conference. Yeah, so a, a few of the you, oh, you can do that. Oh, that's right. Your sister's at pace. Okay, I'm going to bring this one up. I'm going to let uh, Krista talk about this one. I just thought it was cool. Actually, we were actually. My sister is also a librarian. <laughs> She's at Pace University in um, New York, and we were out to dinner together and talking about Twitter and things. Um, myself, my sister, and um, Sarah Burns File, and um, Michael. And she mentioned that 
Pace University, um, the students came up with a Twitter feed called Stuff Your Pace. Basically what it is is any free food that might be available somewhere on campus, someone will tweet about it. So basically, you know, there was this meeting in this boardroom here and there was food delivered and there's leftover food. The food's still there, go and, you know, grab the leftovers. Um, or there's actually free pizza being given away for just, you know, finals week or something, whatever. So poor college students with no money and no way to get their own foods, um, this is a great use of it that they just came up with themselves. And um, people, the students follow it and then can go and get some uh, free lunch and leftovers. And then the food doesn't get thrown away, which is another, like, green thing about it, which is also a nice little side effect. Lots of these things, when you do catering to a meeting, if something's left over, nine times out of ten, it probably just gets tossed. In this case, it doesn't get tossed. The students get to benefit from it. So um, just a very creative, interesting thing that she just said, hey, check, we've got this thing. We yep. should talk about it. So. I mean, I just... I just thought it's just so creative and so different, mm -hmm. and, you know, people are always asking me, why should we use Twitter? And I'm not saying you need to do this exact same thing, mm -hmm. but, you know, everybody jokes, well, Twitter's just about what somebody had for breakfast. Well, here's one as to where you can get breakfast. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, yeah. it's just there's, there's always something creative and something a little different you can do with Twitter, and I just, I just had to share that one. Mm -hmm. I, I thought that was creative. Uh, I'm going to jump around on my list just a little bit here. Um, let's go ahead and uh, stick with Twitter for a moment. If your library, say, does have a Twitter account and you're using that, um, here's a new service I learned about called TwitPoll. And you can easily kind of post a multiple choice or yes, no sort of question to Twitter. It will send a tweet out saying, here's the question, click this link to answer the question, take you to a page, and you can just easily do a very simple poll. You can ask your patrons, you know, okay, our budget's being cut. Should we cut our hours or should we cut services? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm a little pessimistic <laughs> these days with, with things. Um, <coughs> excuse me. But just so, again, another use of Twitter um, and uh, creating polls. Now, with that, the other one I learned about, some people find that Twitter is a little constraining at 140 characters. A little limiting. A little limiting. Some of us are a little more verbose <laughs> than that. So somebody has created Woofer. You know, you have tweet Woofers and Tweeters on um, no, speakers. No, That's no, the connection. Yeah, sorry. I was thinking dogs, and I didn't understand. Well, they, they, it, yes. they still have the dog things. But yeah, um, they, they have a new service here called uh, Woofer. And in this case, you have to type in a minimum of 1,400 characters, <laughs> or else it won't post. So for those of us who have a lot more to say and really just don't want to be limited to 140 characters, here is a service in which you have to post at least 1,400 characters. It looks like we have somebody raising their hand. Uh, Nikki, I have unmuted you. You have a question or a comment? Go ahead, Nikki. We can we have you unmuted. Okay, we are not hearing you coming through. Um, so what I think we'll do at this point is either you 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 uh, hit your hand raise accidentally, which has happened before, or if you could just go ahead and type your question into the questions area of GoToWebinar, and we'll uh, we'll uh, deal with your question or comment that way. Um, give you one more chance to uh, see if we can hear you. Nope, not hearing a thing. Okay, so um, looks like we're having some uh, technology issues there. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, move on to a couple more links here. We're getting close to our time. <coughs> um, changing uh, uh, angles just a little bit here. Um, something also I found out about at uh, CIL is uh, a lot of talk about mobile access to services and some people ask you, well what do I need to do to my website to make sure it's going to work on mobile devices um, this is a little geekier uh, here we're getting a little uh, higher on the technology level here but the World Wide Web Consortium does do uh, validation of your code behind your website they have a new service available called the mobile OK checker and what this will do is you will put in your website your URL and you can have it check your website to see how well it will work on mobile devices. This will not this will check code 
um, but we'll also check things like load time and embedded media, mm -hmm. um, uh, general design of the site, things like that, and kind of give you a, a kind of scale of zero to 100% how well your website's going to work on a mobile device. And um, I put in a couple of websites I know, uh, none of which I will actually pull up live here because it will be severely embarrassing oh. to, to all people involved, and in, in, I will admit, including my own website. <laughs> um, I, I thought it was going to get a pretty high score, and I got a score in like the low 20% good sort of thing. Mm -hmm. I was in the red zone. Have um, you really uh, but I'm not actively tried. tried to make it do that? No. That's the thing, too. I mean, you can just take a website that just has been put up there as a website and try and slap it in there and see what happens. Right. Which is fine, but if you haven't worked to try and make it work with mobile, then sure. Exactly. And and I recently moved my site to WordPress, and I thought, hey, WordPress should be pretty mobile friendly. Mm -hmm. um, but I did find that a lot of the problems I had were with the content I was writing. I was using some embedded media things and uh, some other issues, and and I embed a lot of YouTube videos. Now they don't they don't YouTube isn't necessarily non mobile friendly, but on my homepage I had like seven of them, mm -hmm. and it said, whoa, way too many. Yeah, Dude. but my website's a blog um, versus basic. maybe a static the library's homepage, which may not be a blog, mm -hmm. or I'll have a lot more text. Mm -hmm. So just basically, all I want to do here is point out this tool. If you're wondering how well you think your website will do on a mobile device, a find somebody with a mobile device and look at it. That's a good thing. But if you want to get a little more geeky about it, you can kind of put, pull up your website here, and it will do a check for you and, and give you some uh, good ideas as to what things you might have to deal with to make your website a little more mobile friendly. So, a <coughs> um, couple more links here I wanted to talk about. Um, I've got a book and a Nebraska specific thing. I'm going to pull up here. Um, this is a book I just started reading. This is not a light read. Um, the index and uh, end notes are the last 150 pages of the book. It's <laughs> Krista just gave me that look, like, you know, the index and footnotes are 150 pages. Yes, like I said, it's not a light read, but for those of us that are interested in this concept of intellectual property and how in piracy and where did it, where did this idea come from and how has it changed over the ages as to what is considered piracy, a uh, wonderful book. I've, uh, I'm maybe about 30 pages into it myself. It's, uh, like I said, it's not a light read, but very interesting. Um, and so I thought maybe maybe each month I'd try to throw in a book of things oh, people might be interested reviews, in. Yeah. Book reviews. So not quite a review, but maybe a, a, a light recommendation yes. for, for a very heavy read. But uh, <laughs> awesome. this is the sort of stuff I read in, in my spare time, which I don't have much of. And last thing I will point out for everybody listening to us in Nebraska is that the conference proposal deadline for NLA NEMA 2010 has been extended to April 30th, the end of the month, which is, which is next Friday, two fri next Friday, one week. So uh, I encourage everybody to send in a proposal. We'd rather have more proposals and have to uh, not pick some than not enough proposals and mm -hmm. have to beg people later to present. Uh, so I'm the chair of iChart this year. If you got a tech-related one, uh, give me or uh, Karen Dalziel, our uh, uh, co uh Vice Chair, looking for the right word, uh, a line, fill out the form that is linked to off of this blog post from the NLA blog. Um, we'd be happy to hear from you. Presenting is not as bad as you think. It's actually kind of fun once you get the hang of it. So, um, so with that, we uh, started a few minutes late, but I do always want to leave a few minutes at the end of the show if people have questions about anything that I talked about or other questions that you think I might be able to answer in the next minute and a half. Um, I want to just kind of leave, leave the last couple of minutes open there. If you have a question you'd like to ask via audio, please go ahead and give a hand raise, or else you can type it in in the questions area of the GoToWebinar interface, and I will be happy to attempt to answer those questions for you. Um, sometimes I found I like actually randomly answering questions. Sure. Um, at Put, me on, the spot, Put me on the spot. Put me on the spot. They, uh, while we're waiting for questions here, I'll, I'll share a quick story from CIL. Uh, the conference chair asked me to do a to uh, moderate or facilitate, facilitate excuse me, facilitate a Twitter session, and I asked her, "What does that mean?" And she said, "Well, you stand up and you introduce yourself and." 
give a brief overview of Twitter in about five minutes, and that gives you 40 minutes left to answer questions from the audience about Twitter. And I was like, okay. Um, <laughs> So, in hoping that it wasn't going to, like, nobody had any questions, of course, everybody oh, had questions. There's more than enough. Oh, and it was probably the longest and most fun 40 minutes of my life. Um, Marcia was earlier here talking about, you know, watching the chat room. while well, I was trying to answer audio, audience questions and take questions via Twitter all at the same time. Not doable. Uh, luckily, Krista was in the audience and kind of watching Twitter for me and passing along some questions. Um, so I, I think maybe I have a little bit of a masochist in me, but, you know, I'll stand up in front of a room of a hundred people and say, ask me questions. I think it went very well, though. Yeah. I actually had, um, I, I, as you mentioned that, um, I had on the shuttle bus ride to the airport at the end of the conference, I happened to sit next to a woman who's a librarian from Arizona, if I remember correctly, who said, you were at that Twitter thing. I said, which one? And she mentioned it. And I said, she said, oh, and she had all these questions about it. She's brand new to Twitter. And she thought that was an awesome thing. Oh, People great. asking the questions and stuff. And well, um, you never know when you... I hadn't heard so, that. Thank yeah, you. I had, sorry. I, had I, 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 I did have... seen you. I have had a couple people stop me in the hallway and say, I'm going to try Twitter now. Mm -hmm. um, and I had one lady uh, stop me in the hallway and say, I'm addicted to Twitter now. <laughs> so I, I apologized and thanked her all at the same time. Okay, well, I'm not seeing any uh, questions or hand raised in, the, uh, in the, the audience there, so do we want to wrap this up? Sure, yeah. Um, oh, and I will um, throw out uh, some of the links uh, for the Law Library Conversations and the Lincoln City Library Podcast. I will be adding to the uh, bookmarks list for this session, so mm -hmm. even though you don't see them there now, I will probably get them added sometime this afternoon. So after when, lunch. when the recording for this goes up, this will have all the different things that um, yep. we talked about to add into it. Good. So, uh, yeah, we will wrap it up then. We've hit our hour. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending. I think that was very interesting. I just loved hearing them talk about the podcasting and everything. Yep. Um, very reminiscent of what I do here with Encompass Live, which <laughs> is not a pod. Well, I don't do the podcasting part. It becomes a podcast. Um, but, Richard, I feel for you. I have the same <laughs> issues with getting this thing going every week. <laughs> um, so we are done with today's. Like I said, it, it has been recorded and will be available to you in the next day or so to watch again. Um, I hope you'll join us next week when we will have um, a librarian coming in from Blair Public Library talking about um, cyberbullying, how to deal with that and with your um, page, um, teens and who may be coming into your library and how to handle that in your library. Sounds interesting. So, yeah, I think so. Um, so, thank you very much. Let me open up this one. Cool. And um, we will see you next time. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.